This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 3 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman was published in the weekly Turner's Public Spirit newspaper of Ayer a century ago. I've been publishing extracts from the Wardsman and the Westford Eagle since January 2008 in the weekly Museum Musings column. In this episode, we'll be reading the Westford Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, January 18th, 1908. And I will add comments as we go to more, to, as we go along to more fully explain what was happening 100 years ago. First section is the center section. William Osgood, an old only brother of Mrs. George E. Gould, died at Clinton of quick consumption last week. Uh, consumption was the, what we would call tuberculosis. The body was brought to Westford Monday and placed in the receiving tomb at Fairview and will probably later be interred in the cemetery. Committal services at the tomb were conducted by Reverend C.P. Marshall. You may wonder why there was a delay in burying Mr. Osgood. Osgood. The reason is it was winter, the ground was frozen, and it is really difficult to dig a grave in such conditions by hand. So they waited for the ground to thaw, usually sometime in the spring when they would rebury him in, the, in his uh, lot within the cemetery. The receiving tomb at Fairview Cemetery is in the side of a little hill at the cemetery that faces Main Street for easy access when the snow is deep during the winter. Mrs. Carolyn Atwood passed the 87th milestone of her long life journey Sunday. She enjoys good health aside from some deafness and surrounded by her three devoted daughters, her many friends hope she may see many more birthdays. Uh, Carolyn Atwood was the widow of Daniel Atwood, who died in 1902 at the age of 80. He built the attractive house at 4 Graniteville Road. The Atwoods had three sons who all married and left town, and three daughters, none of whom married and who all remained in the old homestead all their lives. We will hear more about the daughters in future podcasts. Mrs. Daisy Colburn acted the part of Good Samaritan to a Scotch collie dog this week, which in some way had strayed from home and was half starved, starved and frozen. On his collar was the name Jay Foster and the license number, but no town given. With the aid of a telephone, his owner was located in Lowell and came up to Westford and claimed his dog, which was a favorite. He expressed much gratitude for the kindness shown his pet. The annual meeting of the Congregational Church was held according to regular custom on the second Monday in January. The business meeting was preceded by a dinner and roll call. Owing to the prevalence of sickness and other reasons, the attendance was not as large as it has been some other years, but it was the genuine gathering together of the church family, and the spirit of good cheer and good fellowship prevailed. The bountiful and appetizing chicken pie dinner was in charge of Mrs. H.G. Osgood, assisted by Mrs. John P. Wright, Mrs. F.E. Sims, Mrs. John McMaster, Miss Martha Sims, and Miss Amelia Lambert. Immediately after dinner, Mr. Marshall, who was the pastor of the Congregational Church, was obliged to officiate at a committal service at Fairview Cemetery, but was back in time to attend the business session at 2 o'clock. After dinner, the clerk called the roll of membership, and all responded with remarks, quotations, or selections of scripture. Some particularly interesting responses were read from absent members, and in several cases these were accompanied by checks, which bore eloquent testimony for the love and interest in the home church. There was also responses from several visitors. The business session was called to order with Mr. Marshall as moderator. The clerk reported 79 resident members and 18 non-resident, a total membership of 97, as against 84 year, a year ago. The pastor reported that, not, that nine had been added to the church during the past year and that the spiritual condition of the church was good. The report from the superintendent of Sunday school showed the Sunday school to be doing well. The two new classes, especially being formed and organized, classes for men and women. 
He spoke of the faithful work of the teachers. The Sunday school has, during the past year, given $24 for benevolent purposes and about twice that amount for its own expenses. The total membership of the school is 91. The trustees reported the material condition of the church as excellent. Uh, this is the same building that the CPA is now in on Lincoln Street. During the year, the church has been entirely painted inside and newly frescoed, and the church voted C.L. Hildreth its heartiest thanks for supervising the work. This, with other things done, together with the outside painting done one year ago, puts the church building in good condition. The parsonage has also been improved with a new bathroom, new range, and all necessary plumbing, and the piazza is one of the probabilities of the coming year. The church, together with the Ladies' Missionary Society, NCE, that's Christian Endeavor, which is kind of a, uh, uh, also a missions group within the church, have given $195 for missionary causes, besides boxes sent to India and the South. The total contribution for missionary purposes was $219. The treasurer reported all bills paid and a small balance in the treasury. The officers elected for the ensuing year are moderator, Reverend C.P. Marshall, clerk, L.W. Wheeler, auditor, Augustus Bunce, collector, H.G. Osgood, treasurer, Miss L.B. Atwood, uh, that's Lillian Atwood, she's one of the three Atwood sisters, deacon for three years, William A. Perkins, historian, Mrs. L.W. Wheeler, Trustees A.E. Day, H.G. Osgood, Miss L.B. Atwood, Charles D. Colburn, and John P. Wright. The Tadmuck Club met in Library Hall Tuesday afternoon under what at first seemed unfortunate conditions, but owing to some of the members being equal to an emergency, an interesting and enjoyable session was the result. In the first place, the capable president, Miss Loker, was unable to be present owing to illness in her family. This is Miss Loker's third session as president, and it was the first session she has ever missed. She was one of the founders of the Tadmuck uh, Club and was its only president up to this time. In her absence, the vice president, Mrs. Bailey, presided most efficiently. Mrs. George E. Gould was to have supplied current events, but owing to the very recent death of an only brother, did not feel able to be present. Mrs. George T. Day supplied this feature in her usually interesting way. Mrs. Josephine Barnard, who was to have given a paper on Thoreau being out of town, had arranged for a speaker from outside, but who was unable to be present. Miss Ella Hildreth supplied this vacancy in a most pleasing and acceptable way, giving a fine outline of the unique and nature-loving character of Thoreau, outlining his life at Walden Pond and the place he sustained in that famous literary coterie in Old Concord. Miss Emily F. Fletcher gave an account of a lecture she had heard the previous day before the Nashua Women's Club by Mrs. by Mrs. Mabel Loomis Todd of her recent trip with her husband, Professor Todd of Amherst, to, to Chile for astronomical observation of the planet Mars. They spelled Chile, C-H-I-L-I, -I, in, in the paper, in the wardsman. I don't know whether that's a typo or whether that's the way they really spelled it then. Farmers Institute is the next section. The pleasant weather and a program of special merit drew a crowd from all northern Middlesex to the Farmers Institute on Wednesday. This is the first time that the electrics have been available for such an affair, and many took advantage of the half-hour service provided by the management. The institute was presided, was presided over by George W. Troll of Tewksbury. Reverend B. H. Bailey, in a brief address of welcome, was in his happiest mood and gave a splendid and send-off to the meeting. De Lacey Corkum of Billerica responded in his characteristic vein. Then the speaker of the morning, Judge Robert W. Lyman, LLB, of Northampton, was introduced, who gave an address on rural and farm law. He captured the attention of his audience 
and held it closely by giving the, su the supposed life history of a young man and showing the law as he came in contact therewith. And then the next paragraph proceeds to paraphrase that talk. This boy, Ned, was born on November 5th, 1835, sometime after his father's death, so that he was not mentioned in his father's will. Yet he inherited from his father's estate as much as though there were no will. Ned came of age November 5th, 1856. Entering into some business transactions before he was 21, he found that the plea of, quote, infancy, end quote, did not relieve him before the courts of all responsibility, but that the, but that, that plea was to be used rather as a shield than as a sword. Ned found that a fellow could pay so much attention to a girl, even though he did not pop the question, that the court gave judgment against him for $5,000 for breach of promise. He compromised by marrying the girl, who later tried to collect that sum, but she found that she was then considered in the position of a man suing himself, which was not allowable. Ned's hired man, when on an errand for Ned, damaged another man's team on the road at Ned's expense, but when the same hired man turned aside for an errand of his own and met with an accident, Ned had no responsibility. The judge the judges here found that when his livestock of any kind escaped from his enclosure, he was liable for damage. That is, he must fence his livestock in, not fence the other fellows out. And that's the end of that little story. After a few questions had been asked and answered, adjournment was made to the lower hall, where about 350 partook of a bountiful repast provided by Westford Grange under the direction of Fred Smith. Reverend B.H. Bailey, as Toastmaster, told and brought out from his victims many excellent stories. This was uh, held in the town, the old town hall before it was modified, and it had two fairly large meeting halls, on, I think on the second and third floors. So the, the big meeting was held on the third floor, and the uh, meal was held on the second floor. The afternoon session was entertained by a lecture illustrated by the Stereopticon by Reverend George Kennegott of Lowell, who told about his trip on horseback through Palestine when he faced a thoroughly appreciative audience of more than 500 that packed the hall to overflowing. Everything about the Institute went off so well that we regret an accident should have occurred almost in front of the hall the team belonging to Frank C. Wright, rural delivery carrier, was caught by the 2.30 p.m. car and smashed and overturned. Fortunately, neither man nor horse, horse were injured. The car here is the electrical trolley that ran right in front, of the, in front of the town hall and I believe terminated in front of the Unitarian Church, the First Parish Church. The next section is the about town section. C.R.P. Decatur has purchased a tract of wood and lumber of Charles E. Walkden, located on the easterly side of Tadmuck Brook. Cutting has already commenced. There is a possibility that the lumber may be sawed at Dan Sheehan's Cider Cotton Mill Manufactory, which is located on the headwaters of Tadmuck Brook. The Decatur family lived in the old Pelatiah Fletcher House at 54 Lowell Road, and Dan Sheehan's cider mill was located across the street on a little mill pond on Tadmore Brook, and now all in, enclosed in the surrounding woods. The foundation of the cider mill can still be seen there by the mill pond, and it's a nice place to walk if you're looking for an interesting walk. There will be a special town meeting this Saturday afternoon to consider the question of fire apparatus and appropriate money for the purchase of it. Business at the Brookside Mills has departed, where no one knows. Even the administration at Washington claims not to know whither it has, whither it has departed, but only a washman is left to tell a story of departed prosperity, and the water power has leisure to play Niagara Falls. At the terminal of the electric road at Brookside, Chelmsford Division, was once a pole which once had a, held a live wire, but said pole 
was once dashed into an electric car, resulting in the pole no longer holding the wire, but the wire holds the pole. This live wire, with the pressure of this heavy pole, is a menace to life and has been for weeks. Will the selectmen be active enough to receive a slight shock from the vital facts and the story of this live wire? Eric Hedman has built a new barn on his home place on Chamberlain Road near Brookside. Andrew Anderson on Lowell Road has been making some notable improvements on his buildings and improving his farm by removing all petrified substances that offer resistance to farm machinery. I'm sure he means stones by that. Nelson and Lundberg are improving the land they bought of Mrs. R.J. Butterfield near Brookside by digging ditches to remove the surplus fluid that this land harbors. Noah Swenson has been making the flowers of improvement of the, the flowers of improvement blossom about his premises. Axel Lundberg has been adding newness of appearance to his barn. Swedeville at present is the only live spot in the territorial region of Brookside. The area around uh, Chamberlain Road and Main Street had attracted a number of Swedish immigrants, as indicated by the names in this paragraph. So the area was called Swedeville by the locals. The next section is the uh, Graniteville section. Cameron Circle, CFA, that's the Companions of the Foresters of America, the women's organization to the Foresters of America organization, held an interesting meeting at their rooms last Tuesday evening. Considerable business was tr transacted. Under the head of new business, the officers of the court were elected and installed by the court of Ayer, Miss Hannah Scully, assisted by Miss Margaret Murphy, deputy of Ayer Court. The next meeting will be January 13th, and the court will be visited by the Grand Chief Companion, Mrs. Alice M. Bradley of Marlborough. The officers elected were as follows, Miss Rebecca LaDuke, Chief Companion, Mrs. Bridget Healy, Subchief, Mrs. Hannah R. Harrington, Financial Secretary, Mrs. Julia B. Wall, Treasurer, Miss Lena Healy, Recording Secretary, Miss Annie Healy, Right Guide, Miss Dora LaDuke, Left Guide, Grace Ledwith, Inside Guard, Mary Sullivan, Outside Guard, Miss Catherine Rafferty, Miss Margaret Driscoll, Miss Laura Healy, trustees. The next section is uh, Ford's Village section. The Knickerbocker Club held a dance last week, Friday evening. Manager William Wilson, aides Spinner and Dumont. Music was furnished by Home Talent. Cake and coffee was served during the evening. A goodly number were in attendance and pronounced it a pleasant social affair and much credit is due the young managers. There is no dance this Saturday evening. I'm sorry, there is to be a dance this Saturday evening. The proceeds to be given to Miss Ellen McMurray, who has been a sufferer from rheumatism for a number of years. A few weeks ago, she had a fall which has crippled her still more. Miss McMurray is a very esteemable woman and will appreciate the kindness of those who are trying to assist her. Miss Hazel, daughter of A.H. Comey, has been very ill with acute indigestion, but at time of writing is more comfortable. Miss Emma Murphy is suffering from attack of rheumatism. The other sick people are on the way to recovery. There was a reunion of Samuel Blodgett's family, family on Sunday last. Mr. and Mrs. Chester Blodgett and Mr. and Mrs. William Blodgett entertained. Although the weather was so unfavorable, 21 gathered around the table and enjoyed the tempting viands with which the tables were spread, and goodwill and cheer were the social characteristics of the day. I believe the Blodgetts lived on uh, the road that goes up to Haystack Observatory. There was a farm about halfway up that road that kind of straddled the uh, westford Groton line. That I believe that was the one that Blodgetts ran. The Sunday School of Ford's Mission will have as guests next Sunday afternoon the Sunday School of St. Andrew's, Ayer. The service will be at 3.30 o'clock and will take the place of the usual Sunday School hour and evening prayer. The village people are cordially invited. 
The, the Forge Mission mentioned here would soon become St. Andrew's Mission at 25 Pleasant Street in Forge Village, named after its sponsoring church, St. Andrew's Episcopal Church of Ayer. The building is now a private home, but the St. Andrew's Cross may still be seen on the left gable facing Pleasant Street as you drive by. Many years later, St. Andrew's Mission would become St. Mark's Church in Westford. That's the news in Westford for the week ending January 18th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions from the Westford Wardsman at the Westford Historical Society's website at museum.westford.org, or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.